If culturally Christianity is in a neurosis, then our neurosis doesn't have to do with some hang up from the past. It has to do with it present situation that we're not adapted to. And the only way we can find a way forward is by going back and revisiting moments in the past where possibilities for this present are hidden. So when we talked about this last, which was our, some time ago, a couple months ago, we thought of going back into the past to find a way forward, seeds mm-hmm. of Christian secularism. And the whole idea there is that we really don't know how to go forward because all the institutions have collapsed or are collapsing or they've become redefined. I mean, I don't think the Catholic Church is collapsing, but it certainly has a very different role in society than it did like even 75 years ago. 75 years ago, whole communities were Catholic. And now, you know, you have a little Catholic church in the corner where a small group of people who identify with Catholicism go, but there's no, you know, it's pretty hard to find whole communities of Catholics anymore, you know, or whole communities of Lutherans. So these institutions have all shrunk to the margins of our secular society. And the culture itself is no longer religious or identified religiously. And so, yeah, we have all these, these, the the crisis of meaning that we described in the first two seasons. And so the idea was that Christianity is fully compatible with the secular age because Christianity is the self-secularizing religion. Christianity has existed without institutional churches, without religious orders, and without all these things, hospitals, and so on. And therefore, in principle, there's no reason why it couldn't continue to exist once these institutions have served their role and disappear. Or even more strongly put, there's no reason why a Christian couldn't be fully secular if Christianity is the self-secularizing religion. So it gives us this idea that maybe there's a better way of being secular than the secularism on the go right now. Maybe there is a religious secularism or a Christian secularism that not only is something we have to construct, but maybe we're already, some of us are already actually living it. That was the idea. And then then on on the assumption that this is a completely new paradigm, this has never existed before, we go back to the past, not in order to re- you know, to reactualize some old form of life, because that's not on, but to see if we can find there, like, of go, how we go forward, you know? Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. as a psychoanalyst, all of this makes complete sense. Like, yeah, so, I mean, if you think about your own life, like when you think about your life, we only understand our past as we as we move forward into the future. And right. since different elements of our past suddenly assume relevance when there's a new challenge in the present that we have to deal with, we might never have even thought of that moment in the past. We might have completely forgotten it. Yeah, when and I mean... situation brings it out, right? I think we see that all the time, and I see that all the time in the practice room. And I mean, what I like also with the Jungian approach to, to to psyche and development is that, yes, we are looking back, but we're also looking at the present to see what it says about the future. It's not, you know, all about just going back. It's about going back to see what it means for the present and for the future, whether we look at a dream and it's about your mom. It also has something to say about why did you dream this dream now? And what does it point toward? This sort of more perspective attitude of Jung. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. In fact, you know, I might want to say that really, if, if that's what Jungianism is, I'm happy to be a Jungian. And I, I think it's the best idea that Jung has or had, and it's something well worth retrieving, that the real challenge for psychology is meeting the new challenges of the present, and that the, 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 neurosis, is all, the neurosis is a conflict in our adaptation to the present. So it's not so much a trauma in the past that we drag around behind us like a ball and chain, but it's some way in which the present is challenging us to rise to a new selfhood, a new form of being the self that we are coming to be. And we're we're having difficulty. And so the the the, and the difficulty pushes us back into the past. So it's almost as though the past only becomes a problem in the context of conflicts in the present. I agree, and I think also, uh, actually, uh, Freud would agree. Yeah, maybe. There's different Freuds, but certainly that, that seems to me Jung's, Jung's idea of neurosis. 
and and if so if culturally we're in a neurosis, Christianity's in a neurosis, which is probably a good idea, then to you know, be a good assumption, then you know our neuro our neurosis doesn't have to do with some hang up from the past. It has to do with the present situation that we're not adapted to to we are not adapted to. And the only way we can find a way forward is by going back and revisiting moments in the past where possibilities for this present are hidden. Hmm. And where would we go back? I mean, where would we start to go back to yeah. the proceeds of secular Christianity? So on the when we talked last, we spoke about going back to Rome in the second century. I think I said the first century, but I, I, I think the second, first century is interesting, but the second century is where I think we should land if we want to get I mean, there's very few first century authors in Christian authors in Rome, aside from the evangelists, you know, the the gospels were being written in the first century. So uh, insofar as we want to go into the theological tradition that's, that's after the gospels have been sort of uh, consolidated, we need to go to the second century in the Ro in Roman Empire. And then we can go from there. We were going to jump through history. Alexandria in the third century, I suggested. Belgium in the 13th century. Germany in the 14th century. And in each each of these centuries, we were going to find a guide. That was the idea. So if we if today we wanted to talk about Rome in the second century, what a challenge that is. I I don't know how much people know about the ancient world. Probably some people know a lot, and some people don't know very much. But when we think of Rome, I mean the city of Rome at the center of the empire in the second century, an empire that extended from I guess Spain all the way up to the Rhine River beyond the Alps in Germany, all the way over to the into the east, you know, as far as what we now know as the Middle East and North Africa. This is a massive empire. And at the center was this great metropolis, Rome. And Rome probably had close to, you know, had a million people living in it. We're not talking about a little backwater. I mean, this is not some some kind of dark ages place. This is a this is a very sophisticated and already old culture. And it's in this city and also the cities around it around Rome cities in the Roman Empire and in the in the in Asia Minor that Christianity is spreading like wildfire it's a very interesting feature of Christianity that it begins as an urban religion it spreads among the sit in the cities one city after another little conclaves of Christians will break out and and it grows in that way until eventually by the fourth century, Rome has become the religion of the whole empire. So this is one of the greatest transformations in all of human history, that this maverick sect that is originally persecuted, and it comes out of Judaism, and it seems to have attracted the people from the working classes and the lower classes, slaves and so on, would, would and within three centuries become the religion of the whole empire. It's truly extraordinary. And and the and the other thing that's extraordinary, of course, is that this religion espoused many values that were completely opposed to traditional Roman values. So it not, not only did it convert the Roman Empire, but it actually turned the Ro Rome upside down. This is this is that little seed of truth and Nietzsche's point that there was a transvaluation of values or a reversal of values. So whereas previously, you know, might was right and power was more or less worshipped, now Weakness is understood to be a, some kind of virtue, and the, the the least among us are recognized as having dignity, or maybe even being the best among us. Virtues like compassion, and even the beginning of what we might recognize now as a human rights tradition, develop out of this in a culture that was based on brutality, authority, autocracy, slavery. So it's an extraordinary transformation. But if we go back. Before the conversion of, of the emperor Constantine in the fourth century, into the second century, we're, into, we're into, into a really misty period where it's not entirely clear what's going on. As I said, the gospels have been written, and the Christianity is alive and well, and there are figures who are active there, but they're, they're, we just have fragments from them, and we know that they were more or less working in an outlaw capacity. They had priests and they had bishops, but they were subject to random persecutions, some which would be extremely violent, like Nero's persecution, you know, Christians being fed to the lions, and we know that story, and some more sporadic, but in any case, they had no secure position in society. 
And the figure that really strikes me from this period is Irenaeus. He was the Bishop of Lyon in France. He originally came from Turkey. So his dates are 130 to 202. And all we've got left of his writings is a book of called Adversus Heresies, or Against the Heresies. All the other texts have been lost. But he's a very interesting figure. He's seminal for orthodoxy, because what he argued for at that time when Christianity still hadn't really defined the doctrine of the Trinity, what he argued for more or less became orthodoxy. But he's interesting for other reasons as well. One thing that really strikes me is that he is the last known living connection with the apostles. He was the disciple of a guy named Polycarp, who was martyred. Polycarp would have been a Christian teacher who was martyred, his teacher was martyred before him. And Polycarp was a disciple of John the Evangelist. So John the Apostle. And there is a tradition in the church that John lived a long, to a long old age. Many of the apostles died as martyrs, but John lived to an old age. And we now assume that it wasn't the old man John who wrote the Gospel of John, but it could well have been one of old John's old disciples, it was because John founded a community, kind of Christian ashram in Ephesus. And so one of his disciples grew old and then wrote the Gospel of John. And so Polycarp is connected to that Johannine community, and then Polycarp is Irenaeus' teacher. So you have this kind of lineage. It's, it's, it's striking because there, those such connections are not common in early Christianity. The historical record has fallen apart, and there are all these gaps. And this might be a, a news to people. People still labor under the misconception that Christianity is a complete invention. But this is something that is deeply rooted in history. We, 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 there are historical figures, historical events, and texts demonstrating these figures and events all the way back to the death of Jesus. So this is the, the most historical of all religions in a certain way, something I think we talked about in the, in, in the previous seasons. So here we have a figure who's really close to ground zero, you know, the Christ event. And he is a bishop during the persecutions of Marcus Aurelius, the emperor. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but Stoicism is really trending. Mm -hmm. And Marcus oh, Aurelius... Yeah, he's one of the great Stokes. He's a great writer. He's recognized to be a wonderful man, a great wise emperor. He's he's a bit of a hero in our secular age. So we have to wrap around our head around the fact that Marcus Aurelius was also someone who ordered the persecution of Christians, who at least was behind the movement to have women and children torn to pieces by animals in the Colosseum if they refused to recognize him as a god. So this is cognitive dissonance. How does this nice, wise, enlightened emperor, how is he behind such horrors? And I think it's a really interesting question. Why did a good man like Marcus Aurelius persecute Christians? Now, we should notice that he he wasn't as nasty as, as his predecessors. Like Nero was a complete sadist. There's a story of Nero having a dinner party where he's got posts with torches on them to light up the room, but the torches are human beings, Christians, tied to the posts who are burning alive while they're having dinner. So Nero was a complete sadist. This is not Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius is a, a, a refined and educated, and he's a philosopher. He's the philosopher king. So why would he persecute the Christians, or why did he promote the persecution of Christians? And I think the answer is really interesting, and it might help us understand why this period is important for our age. It, the, it, the answer is simple. The Christians refused to participate in the imperial cult. So at this time in the in the history of Rome, the the the, the emperor was worshipped as a god. That was not always the case. Rome was a polytheistic culture, so there were many gods. But it seems that polytheism was deteriorating at this point. This is a a jaded Rome, a Rome that's becoming unfaithful, you could say, or maybe disbelieving the, the, the practice of venerating the gods is decaying. And the emperor at this point becomes the center of a cult in which he is recognized as a god. And every Roman had to pay some kind of tribute to him as a god, and the Christians refused to do so. 
Now, the Christians were otherwise very law-abiding. They were good people. They paid their taxes. They didn't cause a ruckus. They seemed to be utterly innocuous. They worked. They didn't, they didn't make a big fuss about themselves. They weren't trying to set up a new government. They didn't even encourage revolution. But they refused to recognize the emperor as a god because that would have been some kind of religious blasphemy on it. And they even refused to the point of death. Now, many of them, of course, did, under torture, cave in. But many also didn't. And these are the great martyrs, you know, horrible tortures that they were subjected to on pain of, of death to recognize the divinity of the emperor. So obviously Marcus Aurelius doesn't think he's a god. He doesn't, he's not a god. He knows he's not a god. Why is this so important? And I think it's because Rome was conscious of how precarious its po political power was. That is, it, this is this massive area with all kinds of different people living there, huge plurality. It could break apart at any moment. What holds it together? Well, what holds it together is the centrality of the single authority or the sovereignty of the single authority, a little bit like Putin's Russia, you know, or Xi's China. These are also massive pluralistic uh, empires, lots of different people, different religions. It's absolutely central to Xi in China and to Putin in Russia, that the, that he his authority is uncontested. And I think Marcus Aurelius recognized this, that unless his authority was sovereign, uncontested, unconditional, uh, the whole empire was threatened. So Christians then were, in a certain way, upstarts. They were, they were introducing a note of possible political destabilization into a system that really had every reason to worry that it would fall to pieces if people became suddenly, let's say, disaffected with the government. And, and, and so, so, so I think that Marcus Aurelius sees that the Christians are, however, you know, politically neutral they seem to be, are actually a, a, a seed of possible dissent. Um, not, the, not just dissent, but uh, a destruction of the whole emperor, empire. The other thing he didn't like about them is the same thing he didn't like about other religious groups. They were very secretive. Mm. You could do what you wanted in Rome as long as it was in full view. But if you started having secret little meetings on Sunday morning behind closed doors with all kinds of riffraff and aristocrats having dinner together, talking about God knows what, you would just get little glimpses of it. Apparently, they're going to eat each other's flesh and so on. Then, then you know, Rome has reason to be worried because these little secret hives of alternative forms of social organization are the seeds, possibly, of insurrection. So that's why Marcus Aurelius was persecuting the Christians. That's why he tortured Polycarp and killed him. And that's why Irenaeus was constantly living, you know, with the threat of torture and death and dealing with the congregation of Christians who were professing their faith at risk of their life and limb. Now, that, that's obviously nothing like today's situation. But we are in a situation today, however, when political ideology, political uniformity, and the rise of authoritarian states is uh, all too real. You know, post-pandemic, the rise of the return of authoritarianism. The authoritarian regime is always based on the idea that the sovereign is unconditionally the master. And this is what Christians could never agree to. The glory of God is man fully alive, and we are not yet fully alive. The fullness of life is still to come. The Christian teaching is that we are not yet human. We are on the way towards humanity. But if you go back to the second century, there's Irenaeus, he's a bishop. In at this point, there are no churches like buildings, big buildings with you know domes and so on and stained glass windows that, that that only comes later when the when the roman empire converts and then 
the Roman state buildings become churches. So at this point, people are meeting where they can. We, there was certainly a house church tradition that was probably a little before Irenaeus, but it's also very interesting because we know what Roman houses would look like, especially a, a, a house of a, somebody with a bit of wealth. It would be sort of like a little villa, right? You'd have uh, many, many people living there, um, the immediate family, the extended family, the servants and the slaves, uh, and everything needed sort of to look after that society. And I've seen models of these. It's sort of imagine something that almost looks like a college with a little square in the middle, where which would be open to the sun, where people could sort of, I don't know, lounge by the by the fountain or something like that. And all around it, buildings related to the sustenance of this family. That's what a house might look like. And so these these houses became churches when the householder converted. I believe we talked about it. So these these are some, these might be some of the kinds of people that Irenaeus is working with, or Christians who do not own property but belong to one of these house churches. So let's say the slaves of a of a Roman householder, and of, and of course Christianity didn't overthrow slavery initially. That took a little while, but it did require that that slave owners treat their slaves as images of God, as persons with dignity. So these are these are Irenaeus's people. Now, wh what else is he known for? So I said that there's one book left of his. It's called Against the Heresies, and the book is particularly aiming at Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is trending. It's always trending. I don't know why. I always find there's tons of people. There's always a whenever I talk about Gnosticism in my university classes, there's always a few there who are like you know spending a lot of time with YouTube and finding their way into all kinds of Gnostic lore, and they know tons about it, and they can talk about the Demiurge and the Aeons and Sophia and God knows what. So isn't Gnosticism a great thing? Isn't it something that we should just affirm? Why was Irenaeus against Gnosticism? And there's really one simple answer to that. He was against Gnosticism because it devalued the body, and therefore it devalued the world. And here are two features of Christianity that people have forgotten, that Christianity doesn't devalue the body, it affirms it, and that Christianity doesn't devalue this world in favor of some kind of heaven, it affirms this world. It is committed to the world, to the world of time, the world in which we live and, and, and move and in which we develop as children into adults and the political world. It's a, it's a this-worldly religion. Now, of course, this world is only the stage for a world to come, but it's still the preparatory ground. It's not an illusion. It's not Maya. It's not like shadows on the cave wall. And in 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 the, the ancient world at this time, that kind of talk about the world being illusory was very popular. Maybe it's always popular, but it's certainly popular, I think, in times of political and, and cultural decay. You know, the world is so bad, but don't worry, it doesn't even exist. Uh, I had an exchange with someone the other day that really annoyed me. I was talking about what's the, the horror show in Israel right now. And uh, she said, she's a, she calls herself a Buddhist, and she says, she said, it's all in the mind. There in a nutshell is the Gnostic attitude, right? Don't worry, nothing really matters because it's just a show. It's just, it's all passing away. And the Gnostics had a, a very complicated way of justifying this, but their idea was that the that the the world was not created by God at all, but it was created by a kind of a magician's apprentice, a kind of idiot demiurge or a sub god who thought he might you know do what God was doing and create a world for himself, only well, he created it really badly, and then these pure spirits got trapped in this. In, in the prison of the body and in the prison of time and with all of the suffering that it brought about. And so freedom and liberation was emancipation from the body. And so they taught this doctrine that Jesus actually didn't really have a body. He just appeared to have a body, sort of like uh, an alien or something who comes down and puts on a human form in order to save us from the crap. In order to, oh. And the way to be saved is yeah. to recognize that nothing is real. And the danger with that, of course, I mean, it's maybe obvious, but like the obvious danger of that is the sort of depoliticization of of religion, no? or of disbelief. Yes. Because in the end, as you say, like 
it, it's and I heard it too many times. Like it takes away caritas, it takes away yeah. agape, it takes away bodily love. It makes yeah. it a sub project or what you said before. It just moves it away from society. And I mean, it's obvious also when I speak to Swedish people say, who are critical of Christianity. I'm just like, you can be critical of so much around these institutions, but 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 do you see what they do? Do you see what they try to build? They're in the world. They're working That's in exactly the world. Right. If I'm here, if, if any, you know, we have the church here, I mean, all the church, if they are there. The people are coming there. They're open to the world. So I think the, the church has done a great job in, you know, being in the world. But, 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 you know, but, but when it comes to the body, I could say that the church has not made it easy for people to understand what you're saying. To go back to the see yes. that the church is for, or Christianity is for the body. It's for sexuality. Yes. It's for the body. That has the church has done a very bad job in, you know, making people understand, you know, this one. That's a harder one. I would sort of almost want to follow you in your thinking there, because what you say is kind of liberating. But you know, one of the critiques also that Jung raised hundred years ago, hundred one years ago, nineteen twenty three, was just on how how Christianity has repressed the animal or repressed the body. And I mean, there is also truth to that. I mean, you know, there is a truth to that. And yeah. you know, it has not made this argument that you're listing is like. Yeah, who knows about that? That that Christianity is for the body. Oh, that's an excellent point. So I, I make a distinction between Christianity and Christendom. And I think what Jung was railing against, rightly so, was Christendom. And it was the same thing that Nietzsche was railing against. And Christendom is a mixed bag of things. It's not just Christianity. There's a lot of other things in there, including a lot of ancient pagan ideas, too. So there and other attitudes from different corners of the world or whatever. So Christendom is is now gone. And what we're talking about is Christianity. And we go back to Irenaeus and we have someone who is impeccably Orthodox. Both the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, and most Pro most Protestants will recognize that Irenaeus is one of the great church fathers. So, and he what he's dealing with is a a, a faction within his Christian community who are infected by this Gnostic belief, who think that the point of Christianity is to get ourselves out of this bodily life into some perfect spiritual world from which we fell. So it's bound up with the doctrine of, of, of reincarnation. And as you say, it does lead to a kind of anti-politics or deep or a, a, apolitical, you know, who cares? Like, Slavon Zizek has been very good on this. He hasn't talked so much about Gnosticism, but he talks about sort of pop Vedanta, pop Buddhism, which seems to be popular, you know, now and maybe has been for some time, and how complicit it is with injustice. You know, he points out the fact that Heinrich Himmler used to carry the Bhagavad Gita around in his pocket. Now, we don't want, that's a beautiful book, and I'm quite committed to it. So whatever Himmler was doing with the book, the book is innocent. But what he was doing with the book was saying, I have to do this terrible thing. I have to kill Jews. I have to kill women and children. I have to justify mass murder of people. It's a terrible thing that has to be done. And I need to, I need to take it like, like a, like a spiritual being and recognize, you know, that, that this is in some respects is a, a karmic necessity and, and then transcend, you know, his own moral revulsion and his very human response to the situation in, in, into some kind of higher state of consciousness, higher state of unity, where all of the the screams and the pain and the blood and the violence aren't real. So against Gnosticism, Irenaeus said, no, Jesus was not the appearance of divinity in a human facade. He was fully human. He was not dropped to earth from heaven. He was born of a woman, born through the processes of birth. We'll leave the virgin birth aside for a moment, but you know, however Mary was impregnated, according to Irenaeus, there's no question about how Jesus came into the world through the birth canal with all the blood and, and, and the rest. And he suffered in the body. That is, that was really his body writhing with pain on the cross. And he resurrected in the body. It was his body. It wasn't some spiritual form that w w stepped out of the tomb on Sunday morning. It was a body, a body transformed, but nevertheless a body, a body that could be touched, as we see all, notably in the Gospel of John. Thomas touches the wounds. And he ascended bodily. So this great affirmation of the body for for 
Irenaeus was threatened by Christian Gnosticism, and with it, the whole Christian commitment to the transformation of this world and making this world into a just world through whatever political action necessary, without for a moment confusing ourselves with divinity, without for a moment thinking that we can bring the kingdom of God to earth through our own efforts, nevertheless giving our whole lives to the project of bringing the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So this Christian humanism of Irenaeus is summed up in a phrase of his, which is probably the most famous phrase that has come down through the tradition and really the whole point of what I wanted to talk about today. Irenaeus writes, the glory of God is man fully alive. The glory of God is man fully alive. That is the human being with the fullness of life, fully what it should be, the human being thriving in every possible sense, psychologically, spiritually, physically, is God's plan for the world. That's why God was incarnated, not to bring an end to this human misery and bring us into some transhuman place, but rather to perfect the human project. The glory of God is man fully alive, and we are not yet fully alive. Our full, the fullness of life is still to come. Sometimes I, I, I say this to people who are interested in transhumanism, posthumanism, AI, or whatever. I say that the Christian teaching, you know, is not that uh, we have this stable human nature uh, that was made uh, at the very beginning, and now we have to protect it against all these terrible forces of technology and development. The Christian teaching is that we are not yet human. We are on the way towards humanity. Humanity is still to come. There's no like benchmark of this is what this is what is human, and therefore all these other developments are, can be rejected as non-human or inhuman or incompatible with humanity. We're still working towards humanity. The fullness of humanity will not be actual until the body until all our bodies are resurrected, until the resurrected body is fully actual. So Christ's resurrection is just a foretaste of the of what is to come. This is where Christianity gets that future orientation, which is always, uh, also always being forgotten. Not a religion of recollection of the past, but a religion of moving into a future which is uncertain, which cannot be predicted, but which we have reason to hope is going to be better than anything that ever existed before. And this is the source of that Christian confidence, which Irenaeus no doubt evoked in his community, some of whom maybe were being threatened with torture and death. He gave them this extraordinary capacity to witness, to lay their lives down for the truth because of the unshakable hope they had in the promise of the Christ that the kingdom of God shall be on earth as it is in heaven. The glory of God is man fully alive. Yeah, that's for teaching for today, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whatever whatever is human is affirmed by early Christianity. Whatever makes us more human is affirmed. There's nothing human that is alien to Christianity. Whatever it is, sex, work, psychological development, you know, neuro neurosis and its overcoming, all of this mucky stuff, aging, weakness, disability, the whole, everything that is of the human is in some respects affirmed by Christianity. And now, as I said, it's not that we're supposed to just stay in our weak and broken state. We're, we are to anticipate redemption. We are to anticipate new bodies and a new heaven and a new earth, but it will be continuous in some respects with this body. It'll be the perfection of this body. It will be continuous with this earth. It'll be the perfection of this earth. These are points that are constantly being confused by Christians who still tend to be infected by this Gnostic idea that everything is bad and we wanted to all see it, we want to have it all wiped away and replaced by something totally different.